My road to the show was predicated on the fact that I had known George Slaughter for some time prior to the show. Um, I knew him in a different guise, in a different world, because we were both from the East Coast. Um, we had social friends that we knew, and uh, somebody suggested to him that he talk to me about these things. I was doing a lot of dialectic work. I was doing a lot of uh, commercials and cartoons, voice work on car on those, uh, in those areas. And George called me and asked me if I'd come in and to explain to me what the show was going to be all about. And I sat there and I stared at him and I said, you're out of your mind. Because there was no formula, there was nothing. He had a, a mind, he had an idea that was his. It was in his head and he, that's what he wanted to do. And I, he turned to me and said, would you like to do it? And I said, sounds terrific to me. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I was ready to do something a little different, and it, uh, it was nice to be able to perform. Well, I think you have to go back in those days. Ethnic comedy was not uh, socially unacceptable. It was not uh, politically unacceptable. Uh, ethnic comedy was part and parcel of our society. Uh, we laughed at ourselves. We laughed at each other. Um, and I, was, I, I did dialects. I did all kinds of dialects, and that was my strength on the show. So I was, uh, I was ancillary to all of the guest stars that would come on the show because I was the guy that could do the strange voices or the strange dialects and whatnot. And uh, it, it turned out that uh, that made me an, a, a basic element of the show, but it was of, of the period, it was of the time. It's not the kind of a show that could be done today because there are too many sensitivities that would be involved. And you would wind up in, in uh, a legal morass like uh, something you'd never ever could imagine. Um, I had, even in those days, I had a couple of uh, encounters with people who were very upset by what I was doing. Because I was, uh, I was free flow. I just, I just did these things. I did. They would put costumes on me, and I would create character voices for them. I never had any any uh, aspirations to being an actor. I, I when I came out of college, um, I I had no thought of theater or anything pertinent to the theater. I wanted to be in public relations and publicity, and I did. I was in, with Viking Press for a period of time in their PR department as a novice, as a you know, gopher. But um, I learned, my, my school actually was the public transportation of the city of Chicago. We had a city of ethnic islands. You would be able to get on a streetcar at a given point and travel through maybe seven neighborhoods that were ethnically oriented. So that in one section you would have people who were very Nordic, in another section you'd have Germanic, then in the next section you would have uh, Slavic people. And my ear picked up these sounds over the course of time. And I had a natural bent for it. And I think it was because of the musical training that I had that I, hear, I heard the sound, I heard the songs in the voices. And uh, I was very serious about those things. So when I did the crazy things on Laugh-In, I tried to remain within the, within the boundaries of sound that I had remembered of the realistic sound of people talking so that I wasn't faking things, I was them. I was, in, I was involved in it. When I did a Slavic thing, whether it was uh, ostensibly Polish or Ukrainian or Russian, I was listening to the music and the music was there. And uh, it was an acting job. I was acting, but, it, and, and when you stop to think about it, it was a very difficult form of acting because we had such a little period of time in which to establish it. It wasn't like today's performances where you had sketches, full sketches, and where people spend a half an hour explaining what they have done. We didn't have an opportunity to do any of that. You got out there, you, you established yourself, you said it, you did it, and you were done in, in less than 60 seconds. It was a, a challenge in each case. And, um, it was one that I enjoyed very, very much. In fact, I loved the impromptu aspect of laughing. I thrived on that impromptu aspect. I hated rehearsing. I hated rehearsing because I wanted it to be fresh. I wanted it to be on an ad lib basis. And uh, I was very blessed by the fact that George acknowledged that, Schlaughter, and uh, he allowed me to have sort of free base. I had a free run of that. I had tremendous opportunities. Each one of the characters had a foundation somewhere. I, I remember I had the little old man that I had, that funny little guy that 
pursued Ruth Buzzy all over the place. Tyrone. I love Tyrone. Tyrone is one of my favorite characters. Tyrone was predicated on, on a, an actor by the name of Edgar Buchanan's voice and the posture and motions of a, an elderly gentleman who lived in my neighborhood in Chicago, who was a retired police officer, who I, 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 have, I had very strange feelings about him. I always thought he might have been hanging around the playgrounds too often. But uh, he, was, uh, he, he was that man, and I became Tyrone. When I was Tyrone, my wife wouldn't talk to me because I was so outrageous. I was so, I, I just, I was, I grew up to be Tyrone. I am Tyrone today. I, I chased the ladies a lot. I had, that was me. When I was a youngster living in Chicago, we weren't, we weren't exposed to East Indians. We didn't hear the East Indian dialect at all. I had to find that in movies. I found that in uh, Peter Sellers was one of my great, was a great teacher of mine. And ultimately, we became great, great friends because of the fact that he and I thought on that same mad level in terms of that particular aspect of my performing. And, uh, but those, that's where I picked up those characters. I had another character, the little character of Mr. Rasminko, who was the dancing, singing character, which I, it was, it was the chance that I had to really portray madness. Um, I, I got a chance to work with people like Sammy Davis Jr., Bobby Darren, Ad Infinitum, all the musical people I worked with, uh, Danny Kaye. Uh, the character of, of Mr. Rasmenko, who was this great man who had escaped from what was then the Iron Curtain, and uh, he was a, a musical comedian in their sense. And I sang all double talks, so I made up lyrics that made no sense. I had another character that used to stand in the crook of a piano and sing songs that I made up right on the spot. The piano player would play a musical vamp and I would be carrying on. I, you know, I wrote lyrics right then and they, be, they were outrageous. I have people who come up to me now and tell me about these lyrics. I have forgotten them because I made them up at the moment. I have no record of them. And they said, do you remember when you sang that you know, the football song? I said, no. Well, you, that was outrageous. You did it. You know, that was me. That was, that, was, that was what my strength was, and that was basically my contribution to laughing. The writers afforded us plateaus from which to jump. They would set up a pattern for us, and if, if we had the time, if we had the sense, we used those to ad lib additions to their lines, because we had costumes on which changed a great deal of the thing. Uh, we had physical, physicalization that was happening, but the writers were integral to everything. We did, we, we knew them, we had incredible respect. I, I know that every one of the performers that I worked with had incredible respect, and we couldn't understand how they could keep putting this stuff out week after week after week, and, and abstract madness that they would put together. The writers were the show. The writers literally were the show. Uh, without those writers, I don't think there would have been a laugh in. I think that one of the great geniuses of George Slaughter was his capability of finding writers who could work with each other or in opposition to each other, whichever way you want to look at it. Ultimately, the show became a written masterpiece. It was just, it was the writers that set everything up. My younger brother was one of the writers. And uh, I've known him to be a madman all my life. He still is a bit wacky. We sit and watch football games and laugh at each other every Sunday morning. Um, my brother was a, an abstract writer. Uh, he's maintained relationships with some of the fellows that he worked with over those years to this day. And that's quite a long time to have that kind of a lasting friendship. But he worked with guys like Chris Beard uh, who were you know, certifiable. They were literally, some of the writers were totally certifiable. They came up with things you'd say, you belong in an institution, stay away from me. But they were, they were geniuses, and my brother was one of them, and uh, he, he carried his load as well as anybody else. There was no competition among the performers for material. There was no competition. And, uh, and frankly, we worked with each other to the point where we're, we were almost self-directed. Because in those days, we did not have a floor director. We were not directed on the floor. The closest thing that came to the floor was George Slaughter. 
the booth was where things were happening. And sometimes the director, who was a film director, didn't see what was happening on the stage. He would miss entire segments of the show. One of the great, ex one of the great experiences I had was Sammy Davis Jr. and I did a number that was totally ad lib. It was a musical number where we, we played the identical Rosmenko brothers, we were the twins. And it was, you know, here's Sammy Davis and myself, and we're dressed identically. We came out and we did this mad number. I, I forget what song it was. I don't know if it was Old Man River or, or Mississippi Mud or one of the, a, a standard. And we tore that place up. People were screaming and yelling and a voice came out of the booth. Okay, guys, we're going to shoot it now. And Sammy and I looked at each other and we wanted to go up and kill the director because it had all happened on the stage at that particular moment. We went backstage and I looked at him and I said, I don't want to drink. I'm not going to get angry. Can we do this again? He said, let's go get him. We did it better the second time. And it's one of my favorite things in all of the things I've ever done in show business. It was that one incredible, sparkling moment with a great performer like Sammy Davis Jr. I really had no sense of the show being a great hit. I, I didn't discover it until we were like three weeks into the show. When we did the pilot, when we did the initial pilot, it was fun. I didn't know whether or not it would have any validity. I do remember that I was standing with an advertising agency man in a kitchen in the Hollywood Hills, and he turned to me and he said, it's a shame that you're not, your show isn't going to make it. This was Laugh-In. And I looked at him, and I didn't really quite understand. So I said, why not? why not? He said, this is the market, pointing at the kitchen, the cans. And he said, this is the market. And your stuff completely misses the market. The show went on, and he lost his job at the advertising agency. So I, but I never had any idea. And it wasn't until literally like the fourth or fifth week that it was on the air when I suddenly recognized that wherever I went, there were people quoting things and saying things. And then somebody called me from Chicago, which was my old hometown, to tell me that they were changing the train schedule because people were not getting on the, on the trains to go back home. They were staying at the bars and they were jamming up the trains, the later trains, so that the commuter trains had to change their schedule. And that was the writing on the wall. I said, my gosh, I had no idea. And it was. It was, it was a total revelation. I had no idea it would have the impact it did. I was a performer. I had been a working actor. I was doing my job. I did a job. It was a, it was a fun job for me because for the first time I was given the leeway to do the things that I could do the best and that I was given carte blanche to go and do. Um, Prior to that, I was constricted to what was written for me and what this and that, and a couple of commercials that I did allowed me free reign. This was total free reign. I would, design, I would tell them what kind of costume I wanted. I would tell them what kind of music I needed. I would, this, is, this is a position for any performer to be put in that's sort of marvelous, it, it's, as particularly in my, my particular side of, of performing, which was the comedy side, comedy acting ultimately. And um, the only thing that I've always, I've always regretted to this day is in somehow in achieving the success I achieved in that form, the fact that I was an actor was forgotten. And I really never got an opportunity to act after that because I was, ca I was categorized as this guy who does funny sketch comedy. And I never could get a job, but I always wanted to play heavies. I dreamt of playing heavies. I only I played heavies in maybe two movies after that. Never got a, never got a, a single thing that had any relevance to what I really wanted. But I was I had the I had notoriety, and I had achieved great success as a performer. The atmosphere on the set was very free flowing. We were we we didn't really work vis a vis each other. I think one of the things that a lot of people made the assumption I was always asked, "What's Goldie like?" I don't think that I spent on stage with Goldie anywhere near twenty five to thirty minutes on stage because everything was short little pieces and chunks. I, Goldie and I did one musical number together that was absolutely adorable, but it was the only time we ever really worked with each other. Um, Judy Karn and I worked together on a couple of things, but we all, 
we all worked in such, we worked in such dribs and drabs that we never really had the opportunity. The only thing we did was we were very, very conscious of our other performers. And more than once, somebody would turn to me or I would turn to them and say, don't pick up the handkerchief until your third word because you're blocking yourself in that. Nobody else was there to tell us that. We protected each other. And there was, it, was, it was a marvelous feeling because there was no, we just, we just worked together. We worked together constantly. I can honestly say that in each case, uh, that there is nobody that stands out over and above anybody else. We, remember, I had, we had Goldie Hawn, we had Lily Tomlin, Joanne Worley, who was absolutely incredible, Ruth Buzzy, these were our ladies. Then we had Teresa Graves, uh, Chelsea Brown. They, they were, every one of them added a dimension so there was no one person that you, you, you had an opportunity to say, well, this one is terrific. And they were all great. And the guys had the same, the, the men were the, the biggest thing I had was Henry Gibson and I were constantly confused for each other because we were the same height. And I, I, I guess we exuded the same quality, but I was doing certain things and Henry was, but people would come up to me and say, tell me the poem you said. And Henry was known for his poems, that he would come out holding a little flower and he would say, um, so and so, so and by Henry Gibson. They thought Henry Gibson was a character that I was playing. Poor Henry, on the other hand, was constantly being asked by people to say very interesting because they thought he was being the, the little German. So that was an area of confusion. But the two of us to this day are very, very close friends. Um, the, the, he, is, he and I are on the phone at least once or twice, you know, every two weeks or so, just to kibitz and say what's happening all over. Um, it was a cast of people who had respect for each other's performances. We were not new people. We had all had a road that we had covered over a period of years. We were professionals. Uh, we had a history in show business. And uh, we were, it was our field. It was our field of endeavor. It was where we worked and we worked with integrity with each other. I was the auxiliary performer on the show. Whenever there was a sketch that had to be done, I was the guy that was thrown into the pot because they knew that I could. I, I ran the gamut. There was the Sid Caesar. There was Danny Kay. There was there was um, Peter Falk. I mean, Peter and, and there was Don Rickles. Um, I worked with everybody. I worked with everybody. But when it came to real crazy performing, I'd say. Sammy Davis and I were almost like brothers. We'd known each other a very, very long time. I had known Danny Kay over a lengthy period of time. I had, he was my mentor in a strange way because uh, as a kid, I, he was my hero of heroes. Um, I, I, you know, they, they were all so magnificent. I, I can't even, you know, I keep seeing shows or hearing about them. I, I remember working a show with Ken Berry and Ken and I did a dance number, and I, somebody told me, somebody called me on the phone and said, I didn't know you knew how to dance. And I say, I forgot that I knew how to dance. I, it's been so long ago, I forgot, how was I? You were terrific, you, you were a good dancer. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I was a good dancer. I can't walk now, but I was a heck of a dancer back then. But every one of these people I had a chance to work with were just absolutely magnificent. I, I really, I once tried to make a list of the people who I had worked with over the course of years, and it's now reached like eight pages of double columns, small print. And I look at it and I say, wow, what a lucky guy I was. I had John Wayne, I had Bob Hope, Greer Garson, Lena Horne. I just, everybody that I had worked with over the course, and I, and I thought to myself, that was the who's who of what was what. Those were the greatest performers ever. They're not being replaced. And it's, uh, I was lucky. I was just darn lucky. I, for a guy that came out of not really being interested that much in show business, I wound up very much a part of it. George recognized what the capabilities of his cast were, and he gave them free reign in that respect. The only, times, the only times there were uh, any kind of problems is when we would sit down and do a reading and the recognition was that one performer had a preponderance of material while another was slighted. 
and then changes had to be made in that material so that it could be pushed around so that was a, a better distribution for the individual performers. Um, George, George was like a cheerleader. George was a great cheerleader. He had a great laugh. And he did some marvelous things. I had a terrible, I had a fun thing with George because I played this old man and at the end of the act, Ruth Buzzy would manage to knock me off the bench. I would fall down. When they would holler, I refused to get up. I would lay there stiff as a board and they had to come and carry me off the stage. And that was for the benefit of the audience that was there. And George loved that particular moment because he would run out on the stage, all right, pick it up, pick the stiffy up, let's get him out of here. George was our cheerleader. George, you could hear George laugh. If you listen to the show very closely, I can spot George's laugh in pieces because we used live laughter. We did not use canned laughter. Um, he was, he was, very special. He, he was special in the fact that he managed to put together this group of people, managed to find the writers to, to give them the capability of doing what they did to the best of their talent. And he found the people to, to be the performers and he trusted them. He trusted, he trusted us as individuals in the sense that he knew what our capabilities were. And if we came and objected to something, he listened very, very strongly because uh, with rarity, if somebody felt they were uncomfortable with a piece of material, um, George was very understanding of it and he would say, okay, don't, you know, okay, uh, no, you don't have to do that. Don't do that. If you feel that, don't do that, which is nice. But it, uh, as a father figure, no, George was never a father figure. George was the head cheerleader, cheerleader and he was magnificent at it. The problem of thinking Laugh-In has a legacy is the fact that there are so few people today in, in the media who are old enough to remember Laugh-In in its original form. I've seen so many columns written telling, me, telling us how brilliant Saturday Night Live is, that it was the, the innovative show of all time. And I sit there and I sort of seethe inside because I keep saying to myself, well, you're too young to have seen the progenitor of that. Plus the fact that Laugh-In was not the beginning. Um, Ernie Kovacs, who nobody remembers, Olson and Johnson before Ernie Kovacs. Humor is probably something that has been, is the same in a strange way since the days of the Greek theater. The same things that were funny then are funny now. Um, Laugh-in, the, the good part of Laugh-in was the fact that there's a generation out there that has still can remember having some of their funniest moments sitting in front of a television set in their youth and just laughing their heads off, whether they were in college or in grammar school. I've had people walk up to me who I know must have been very young when they saw it, but boy, they quote lines. And so laughing made people laugh. And it, it was of its time, it had meaning, it was apolitical, it, uh, it was asocial. It was willing to pick on every element in society with no regrets whatsoever, but everybody got equal time. Um, there were no winners or losers. Everybody was involved. They just, it was a comment. It was a comment on the period of time. Today, they use words that we couldn't even dream of using on television. I see attitudes that I couldn't in a million years. Themes of whole shows that are predicated on subject matter that was so untouchable in my days. And, I, and all I can say is, if that's what they want, that's what they get. I cannot, I'm not part of it, but um, it's changed a great deal since we did humor, and humor was based on what we thought was really funny and not shock value. We didn't deal in shock. Today is more shock humor than it is humor humor. So as an old fuddy-duddy, I just sit there and I, I can't do anything about it. So I say, okay, if that's what they want, fine. We've come a long way since we had charcoal and put it on our hands and put it on the walls in the caves in the old days. We've come a long way. 
And I, 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 I see that this is just one step towards something else. Somebody else will come up with another concept and it'll be different. <laughs>